All right, ladies and gentlemen, so it's time to kick off uh, our pre-calculus talk. Um, obviously here in section 1.1, and um, as you kind of go through some of these videos, what we're going to start to notice is um, our, our pre-calc talk, you know, should be a little bit of a review as we open up about it, some things kind of back from even Algebra 1, um, with some Algebra 2 topics as well, but even as far back as Algebra 1. Um, in this first video that we're going to dive on into, guys, um, the goals just in general for all of uh, 1.1 are to look into sketching graphs, finding x and y intercepts, using symmetry to sketch graphs, finding equations in graphs to circles, and then use graphs in uh, some real life instances. And then kind of an add-on in there is to dive into a little bit of our parent function. <coughs> So, without further ado, let's get rocking and rolling. And as the great Heath Ledger once said in one of the greatest movies ever filmed, and here we go. Parent functions. Let's start off with parent functions to start off with here. So I, uh, I challenge you all right, to pause the video and think about where each of these choices, so these all kind of are, are matching in a sense, all right? Take a look at all of the different graphs that you see on this, func on this screen right now and see if you can match up each of these graphs with the parent function, the base of each of these functions. So give it a shot, pause the video right now. Well, as you hopefully have gone ahead and, and made a challenge, we see that this is our y equals one over one, x, one over x squared. Here is our root x parent function, basic square root of x formula. And then we've got y equals tangent of x headed down on over here. Likely coming on down over here, this is the typical example of our straight linear equation, our straight linear equation here. So we'll move our y equals x right on over. This was our cubic function, because we see that uh, specifically the origin symmetry, which we'll talk about here in just a little bit as well. Uh, over to the right-hand side, hopefully you remember this, our parabola, our U-shaped graph as being our quadratic or our squared functions. Again, on over here, perfect example of our origin symmetry. Going to cross that origin with y equals 1 over x. Coming on up next, we're going to see that we have our graph for y equals sine of x. We know that it starts at 0, being that starting initial point ending on over here at 2 pi for a, a total of 1 period, which we're going to dive on into at some point as well. That V-shaped graph shows our y equals absolute value of x. And then finally, when x is 0 but y is 1, we know that we've got our y equals cosine of x graph coming on into play. So why are we diving on into this? Well, this is first and foremost one of the biggest things that we're going to have to know as we dive farther and farther into pre-calculus and then eventually into calculus as well too. It's going to have to be quick second nature to know some of these parent functions, um, especially when we start diving in domains and ranges and shifts and uh, symmetry and uh, even odd functions, all of those things as well too. Knowing what these graphs look like. Um, know what the limits of them as well too. You know they'll be super super important as we continue to go through our time in this class. <coughs> so let's go into a really basic example to get things rocking and rolling for today. And so again, this is just kind of refreshing our memory a little bit on what does it mean to sketch a graph? What are we looking like? Because I promise at some point we are going to need to know um, a lot more than these basics, but before we can kind of dive farther into the basics or, or into the complex, let's make sure we've got uh, an idea for the basics. And so as we look into this first one, <coughs> we're going to be looking on into 1 minus 3x. All right, the first thing to know is the degree of that function is a linear function because the highest exponent is just simply going to be 1. So we all agree if I just rewrite this, I'm just going to rewrite this as negative 3x plus 1. All right, in my opinion, it's always easy to understand that that y equals mx plus b, our slope-intercept form, gives our y-intercept right there at 1. And then we have a slope of negative 3 over 1. So down 1, 2, 3 over 1. 1, 2, 3 over 1. We'll do one in the opposite direction. 1, 2, 3 and over 1. 
So obviously here we can kind of get an idea of our line that will connect right through about there. All right, off a little bit, but you get the picture as we kind of make those lines through. All righty, so let's look on to our next one, our x squared minus two. Well, remember guys, back in our times of dealing with shifts and movements of graphs, remember when we see a shift, a change happening on the outside of the squared function. That is a vertical shift, and it's exactly what you see. Horizontal shifts happen inside the squared function, and they are the opposite of what you see, right? And so let's kind of think about this for a sec. If we know that, and don't necessarily draw this one on now, but we know that the original x squared parent function is something of the resemblance right here. Well, we have to shift this graph two units from its starting point. So really, we're going to hit the y-intercept right on there, and then we're going to have our graph of the function something of the nature. Now, we're not diving, obviously, too far into the exact values and all the things, but we get an idea as to where we're going to find those as well. All right, so again, very basic to start some things on off with. And that's going to lead us on into graphical symmetry, is when do we have graphical symmetry? Well, there's three different ways you can see it. You can see graphical symmetry around the x-axis, the y-axis, and the origin. So how do we know when we can find either of them? Well, let's take a look here. <clears throat> you want to think of graphical symmetry as a reflection. There's that term again from geometry back in the day. It is a reflection. So if I reflect something over the x-axis, as we can kind of see right in here, if this originally started at the point A comma B, you gotta think about what's happening. If I'm reflecting over the x-axis, the x values are not changing. That's the same x value at x equals A over. But what does change is the y values. We have now gone into quadrant four, and so now we have reflected on over and changed out our y's. Very similarly for y-axis symmetry. Now, once again, just the only real difference that we are dealing with in this case, again, we see what's happening here. In this case, if this is the point A comma B, this Y value of Y equals B is not going to change at any point through that reflection. It'll be the same thing on both sides as we continue to go all the way through this graph. And so what we end up seeing is the reflection in which we change or we negate the x values. And then lastly, our origin symmetry. Or our origin symmetry, we want to think of it more so um, almost as a rotation, right? And so if you remember back into geometry terms, our rotations, our coordinate rules for a 180 degree rotation of the point A comma B, you rotate it and you end up with the point negative A, negative B. How does this work? Well, because if I'm currently in my first quadrant, to go on into our second quadrant, we are now going to make it somewhere right on in here. And this is going to give us the points of negative A, positive B. Because we have switched the x and y distances, but we stayed in the third quadrant, which makes our x coordinates negative and our y coordinates positive. When if you did another 90 degree rotation on in there, we are now finding ourselves into our quadrant three in which we have both negative x's and negative y values. And so that's where we get our origin symmetry as kind of a rotation of 180 degrees. But in a sense, I mean, you're still doing the kind of same thing. It's still a reflection over the origin as well too. All right, <clears throat> so let's take a look here at some uh, other ways we can utilize some of these basic concepts. And we're going to step back and talk for a second about the x and y intercepts themselves. So think about it for a sec. The key point of this slide is to understand what the values represent when we talk about x and y intercepts. Well, what does the x intercept actually mean? Well, the question I have for you is the x intercept means what value is zero? Well, hopefully we know that means our y value is zero. All right, and then think about what it means for our y-intercept, right? And so for our y-intercept, that means that our x 
value is going to be zero, right? That's what we're trying to represent. And that's why we see, and we'll talk about here in just a second, when we see certain um, vertical lines, remember vertical lines basically go through all of our x-intercepts because it's all of x equals some constant c. And that's why all our horizontal lines go through the y-axis at some value of y equals c because the same x value is the same thing throughout the entire vertical line. The same y value is the same value for the entire horizontal line. And so let's dive on into the next question is how many x-intercepts, <coughs> excuse me, or y-intercepts are we going to be end up having, actually having in this case? So let's think about this for a sec. I, the opening question for this example is how many intercepts could you possibly have? Well, let's think about it first and foremost. In that very first one, we have a cubic scenario. Well, if we have a cubic scenario, that means the degree is 3. Well, what do you think how many total x-intercepts we are going to have? Well, hopefully we see that we're going to have three x-intercepts and then our one y-intercept. So let's find out exactly when and where these occur. So for part A, how do we find out what our x-intercepts are? Well, again, think about what it means to be an x-intercept. That means the y-values are 0. Well, if the y-values are 0, make y equal to 0, right? If the y-values are 0, make y equal to 0. Well, all right. Continue pushing forward. How do we solve for a cubic like this? We have a common factor of x in both of them. We're going to factor out that x. You're left with x squared minus 4 times x. Well, now we've got two basic uh, uh, factors to solve for. So we know one factor is going to be that x equals 0, and the other one is going to be that x squared minus 4 equals 0. I add the 4 on over, I get x squared equals 4. And then we know that we get x equals plus or minus 2. And you're never going to forget to add that plus or minus when you're solving for x because we have the negative or the positive that will work in this case. All righty. So x equals 0, x equals positive 2, and x equals negative 2. So to answer the question, the three x-intercepts happen at 0, 0. They happen at negative 2, 0, and they happen at 2, comma 0. Well, what about for the y-intercepts? Well, again, think about what it means to be a y-intercept. That means the x values are 0. Well, just like we did for the same for the x-intercepts, we're going to make the one that we want 0 be 0. So we want to make the x's 0. Where does the y occur that the x's actually are 0? And 0 cubed is 0, so that's going to cancel on now. 4 times 0 is 0. So y equals 0. Thus, we have a y-intercept at 0, comma, 0. So y-i-n-t's and x-i-n-t's. All right. <clears throat> so let's kind of keep pushing forward a little bit. Now, let's keep pushing forward a little bit here. For our next one, and I'm just going to go ahead and erase some of this stuff that's on here now. So for our next one, we got y squared equals x plus 4. Four, right? y squared equals x plus 4. Well, do we all agree if we kind of rewrite it in, in such a sense that maybe it looks like this, right? right? Maybe it kind of looks like that a little bit as well. We'll get there and we'll talk about our e equations in just a sec, right? But I want to go ahead and just rewrite by rooting both sides that y equals the root of x plus 4. All right, well, why do I want to do this? Because personally, I think it makes us make a little bit more sense of what we are actually trying to be solving for. So once again, for our x-intercepts, we want to go ahead and find out what values of x show that y is 0. So we're going to make y 0, and we're going to go ahead and solve for x in this case. So we're going to kind of do the opposite. We're going to square both sides now, which we get 0 equals x plus 4, or we're going to see that we end up having and x equals negative 4. So negative 4 comma 0 will we find an x-intercept. And again, then that makes sense. Think about what we're dealing with. We are dealing with one particular all right, unit where this is going to happen. We know our parent function. This is a root function. So that's going to be a shift simply of 4 to the left. And that makes sense. 
a shift of 4 to the left. That's what we get negative 4, comma 0, for our, uh, our use, I guess, that we see right there. All right, well, <coughs> excuse me, what about our y-intercepts now? Well, I'm going to use the original function at y squared equals x plus 4 because I want to go ahead and find out what values of y are going to be when x is 0 this time. And so now we're saying y squared equals 4 root root. And then we see that y equals plus or minus 2, which in this case we end up showing that y will end up getting us 0, 2, and 0, comma, negative 2 for our y-ints. All righty. So, what I would like you to do um, is give this one here a shot. And so as you'll see, as these videos continue to go on, um, as we close up the videos 99.9% .9 of the time, you are going to have a question in which I'd ask you to solve kind of on your own. And here is your first one. And we'll go over it first thing. Have a good one, folks. On to the next one.